Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> All right, let's uh, use our second lesson in uh, First Thessalonians. Let's open up to uh, chapter 5 once again. I'd like to read verses 16 through 19. Chapter 5, verses 16 through 19. Uh, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Um, what struck me most about these verses at the end of Paul's first letter to the Thessalonian church is that they are essentially his concluding remarks. Uh, the entire book of First Thessalonians comes before he exhorts them to give thanks. This begs the question, how does Paul come to, the, to this conclusion that we should be thankful for everything? Um, Paul doesn't just tell them to be thankful. Uh, what we will see um, is that he actually shows them how to be thankful. Uh, with his exemplary behavior uh, before commanding them to do the same. Uh, let's open up in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day that you've given to us, and thank you for allowing us to come together and uh, um, opening up our, our prayer requests to you and to each other. And um, Thank you for um, gathering us here and opening your word and uh, Thank you for the book of uh, First Thessalonians that we might be able to learn much from it. And uh, um, pray the Holy Spirit will uh, um, uh, speak to us here tonight. In uh, Jesus' name, amen. Okay, in review, last week we, we introduced Paul's letter to the Thessalonian church by answering five questions. Who wrote it? Um, Paul, Paul wrote this letter, the Apostle Paul, and uh, we saw that the epistle presents itself as a letter written from Paul in two places, in, in chapter 1, verse 1, and also in chapter 2, verse 18. Uh, we then spent most of our time last week in the book of Acts, um, overviewing Paul's second missionary journey leading up to his arrival into the city of Thessalonica. And to whom was it written? We saw that uh, Paul wrote this letter to the church at Thessalonica. Uh, then we tried to paint uh, the clearest picture we could of the city of Thessalonica and its uh, people by investigating its founding, uh, and being conquered by the Romans. But most importantly, we, we learned that the city was a very prosperous one. Uh, mainly because of its strategic location, uh, being on the coast, uh, which gave it a magnificent harbor, along with being uh, located directly on the most important east-west highway in the Roman Empire called the Anetian Way. Um, we also saw some of the characteristics of his people. Um, we described them as cosmopolitan and idolatrous. This next slide is a, uh, a recent uh, picture of um, Mount Olympus from Thessalonica, from the harbor of Thessalonica. And last week we, we saw that, um, um, that they uh, looked at Mount Olympus and uh, imagined that the gods were um, conducting council there. Um, we also saw that uh, how Paul and his companions came to Thessalonica. Uh, they didn't arrive there by happenstance. Um, we then saw in, in Acts chapter 17, um, Luke's description of the gospel uh, 
message which Paul preached. And he responded, you know, and the response Paul got from that message. Not only were a great multitude saved, but many were, uh, not only were a great multitude saved, but many were not saved, um, who included the Jews, who uh, set all the city in an uproar, which ended um, with forcing Paul out of the city, uh, leaving him with a little knowledge um, of how the church uh, was progressing in sanctification, despite this persecution that they were they were having there. So we also saw that um, Paul was forced out of Thessalonica, and um, from Athens he sent Timothy back there to report back to him directly on their spiritual condition. Um, So what's in this book? We saw last week that uh, a few different outlines. Um, We saw that um, the very simple outline was uh, chapters 1 through 3, is Paul's personal reflections, and chapters 4 through 5 are instructions and encouragement. It's uh, very similar to um, the book of Ephesians where he gives a bunch of doctrine and then there's a therefore and he has application. And uh, we also saw this outline, which is a chapter outline, and there's five chapters in the book of Thessalonians. Uh, chapter 1, we saw that it's the Lord's coming is related to salvation. And in chapter 2, we saw that the Lord's coming is related to Christian service. In chapter 3, we saw that the Lord's coming is related to sanctification. In chapter 4, the Lord's coming is revealed as a comfort as certain as the central doctrines of Christ's death and resurrection. And in chapter 5, the Lord's coming is our motivation for diligence. And we also introduced a more detailed outline. We'll be um, diving into the the text here shortly. Um, And uh, Paul's salutation is in um, verse 1. If we can turn to um, verse 1 in chapter 1. But before I do that, I'm going to to say that what makes makes the the epistle different? Um, What makes the epistle different is that we see in First Thessalonians the hope of Christ's return is prominent in this epistle. And this slide was introduced last week when um, Dwight Pentecost, in his book, Prophecy for Today, he says that he goes through the New Testament and without, almost without exception, when the coming of Christ is mentioned, um, it is followed by an exhortation to godliness and holy living. I thought it was a, a wonderful quote. And we need to be careful when we study prophecy. Um, some only study prophecy because it's a, an interesting um, subject and uh, people sometimes don't see Christ in prophecy. <clears throat> so the last underlined quote here is, We've missed the whole purpose of the study of prophecy if it does not conform us to the Lord Jesus Christ in our on our daily living. Hopefully we can see that in our study tonight. And also, uh, what we saw last week was the the placement of the rapture uh, within prophecy. Um, uh, currently we're in the church age. And the the next event um, 
which is to happen in, in eschatology, which is the end time, is the rapture of the church. And um, this is the the main event that uh, the book of First Thessalonians is uh, um, is talking about. And the last thing that uh, in review um, during the the last few chapters, the, during the last few ver- the last few few verses in each chapter, um, Paul brings out and summarizes um, uh, the hope of Christ's return in the last few verses of each chapter. In chapter 1, um, in verses 9 and 10, we see that Paul relates salvation to Christ's coming by stating that Christ delivers us from the wrath to come. And also in the end of chapter 2, in verses 18 and 19, um, uh, Paul's hope was to preach the gospel so that those who those he ministered to might join him in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. And we also saw at the end of chapter 3 that um, in verses 12 through 13 that Paul exhorts them to establish their hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, we saw at, at, at the end of chapter 4, um, this is the passage along with 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verses 51 through 58, where, which is one of the central uh, passages dealing with the rapture of the church. And lastly, at the end of chapter 5, um, Paul exhorts them to uh, be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, now getting on track with um, the salutation in verse 1 in chapter 1. Um, if we read chapter 1, verse 1, um, Paul, Salvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, See, this represents a a typical salutation in the first century, which has three parts. There's a writer or writers, the recipient, recipients in this case, and a greeting. And um, let's start by looking at the writers. The the three chief partip- par- participants in the second missionary journey appear in Paul's opening words here. It would seem apparent that there are that these are the ones whom the Thessalonians would have identified as their first pastors. Paul being the leader and thus first in the greeting. The apostle's sense of ministry being a team activity would best account for all three names being included here rather than uh, the thought that this letter was somehow written by them all. And we, we, see, we will see that when we get to verse 2 that the, um, the use of the plural pronouns we, us, and our use ex- extensively throughout the epistle. And moving on to the identification of the, the recipients, um, Paul very specifically identifies the recipients um, of this letter as to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, This addresses his flock in three ways, corporately, geographically, geographically, and spiritually. And as a group of people, you know, they were the church, uh, which is uh, the Greek word ecclesia, or literally the called out assembly. Assembly. 
With rare exceptions, the word church in the New Testament refers to the gathering of true believers in Christ. Or in this case, um, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Taking a, a deeper look at this, this word church, um, in the New Testament, um, the word church is used uh, ex- the word church is, is extremely important uh, when we study eschatology. Um, the doctrine of the church has been rightly considered by theologians of all points of view as being an internal, an, an integral and important aspect of theology as a whole. You know, systems of theology can often be characterized by their doctrine of the, of the church or, or ecclesiology. We'll be learning a little bit more about the doctrine of the church during our next BTCP program starting next semester in September in class number five. And uh, the, the premillennial system of interpretation has especially relied on a proper understanding of the doctrine of the church as a body distinct from Israel and from um, saints in general. In other words, the church is not Israel, nor does it include the saints of all ages. What is essential in premillennialism becomes an indispensable foundation in the study of pre-tribulationalism. I think I had that slide here. Um, It is safe to say that um, pre-tribulationalism depends on a particular definition of the church. And any consideration of pre-tribulationalism that does not take this major factor into consideration will be largely beside the point. Um, I won't take the time to uh, dive into a doctrinal treatment of the the church right now, but just want to say that uh, if the term church uh, includes saints of all ages, then then it is evident that the church will go through the tribulation. Um... as all ages, um, uh, that there will be saints in all ages. Um, I'm losing my spot here. Um, If, however, the term church applies only to a certain body of saints, namely the saints of this present dispensation, then the, the possibility of the rapture or the translation of the church before the tribulation is possible and, and even probable. So defining the word church is essential when related to the rapture. And uh, I've been doing quite a bit of reading in this and on this topic and uh, along, along with uh, also defining the word um, tribulation. You know, does the word tribulation encompass every little difficult trial and circumstance we face every single day? Or could there be a, a point in time where the word tribulation could describe a future time of trouble which uh, will significantly which is significantly greater than any previous time and i hope to look at that um, soon back to our identification of the recipients um, the second way paul identifies the recipients is uh, geographically, as the Thessalonians. Um, The local church was made up of uh, those from Thessalonica who had believed in Christ. And we described last time how a culturally diverse uh, and idolatrous multitude turned away from the idolatry and decided to place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the third and most 
important qualification um, in identifying this group um, is that they were in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this would spiritually distinguish them from the Jews of the uh, synagogue, for instance, who rejected Jesus as Messiah, and also the civic assembly um, of the people who believed Christianity um, undermined or overthrew their structures of political authority. And notice the, cro- the close proximity of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ emphasizing Christ's equality with the Father. Now this points directly to uh, the deity of Christ, uh, the triune relationship of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is assumed here since Paul is, will shortly speak of the Holy Spirit in verse 5. And then Paul uses the full title um, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul indicates three truths about the Savior by using his, three, uh, his full title. The Lord Jesus Christ, first, he is Lord. Um, or Jehovah of the Old Testament, which points to his deity. Next, um, as Jesus, and he is declared as being human, and his, his earthly name means Jehovah saves. And thirdly, as Christ, who is the long-promised Messiah or the anointed one of the Old Testament. And having identified the recipients of this letter, um, the apostle briefly but warmly greets them with a typical remark, um, grace to you and peace. And um, in the New King James, it adds, uh, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Paul always puts grace first and then peace. God's grace, which is unmerited favor, is the foundation which leads to our peace. In other words, peace is the result of God's grace. And one final observation on verse 1 here. Um, The absence of any reference to Paul's apostleship um, in any of his inspired writings uh, to the Macedonian churches, namely Thessalonica and um, Philippi, uh, is, is interesting to note. He, he mentions his apostleship in all his other epistles, and sometimes he had to defend it vigorously, um, for instance, in Second Timothy. And ev- evidently, the Macedonian churches, they probably never questioned his apostleship, as did uh, the other churches. Moving on to, in our outline. Uh, We're going to move from verse 1 to verse 2. I'm going to read verses 2 to 3. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. Uh, Verse 2 begins with the word we. Um, We give thanks to God always for you all. Implying that all three missionaries prayed together. Notice the word we. Throughout the epistle, Paul primarily references the missionary team instead of just saying I did this or, or I did that. Paul uses the words we and us and are to reflect the fact that he spoke on the behalf of Silas and Timothy. You know, there are rare occasions uh, where he reverts to using the, the pronoun I uh, when he speaks of 
you know, something unique to himself or uh, when the fact that he actually wrote this letter uh, comes out. But primarily he uh, was part of a team. And if we take a look at how many times the word we is used in First Thessalonians, it's used 48 times. The word us is used 21 times. And the word our is, u- is used 27 times. For and If you add those up, it's 96 times. Paul is part of a team. He only uses the word I seven times. I thought that was pretty good. <clears throat> Primarily, when we're work, when we're in a working environment, and you know, if you're the boss, you know, there's a lot of work to get done. You know, usually much more than the boss can do by himself. Uh, and the, the boss's main function, many times, is one of you know delegation or or process management. And therefore, the success of the the team depends upon the performance of the team as a whole, not just you know one individual or or the boss. So so leaders who who want their team to succeed, they they tend to um, spend their energies um, improving the performance of those uh, who they're leading instead of just focusing upon making themselves look good. Notice Paul doesn't solely take credit for for what he's being what's being accomplished here. He is he's a part of a team and and he and that shines throughout this entire epistle as you can see here. Um, back to the phrase we give thanks to God always for you all making mention to, um, to, of you in our prayers. The Thessalonians' response to the gospel and their continuance in the faith caused Paul and his companions to thank God for them continually. Obviously, Paul did not mean that he spent all of um, his time praying for the Thessalonians. You know, they prayed for them continually rather than continuously. And praying continually is kind of like talking to God on the telephone. You know, Paul doesn't, he wasn't praying continuously. He, he was just leaving the connection open and leaving the phone off the hook, so to speak. And, um, and one major thing we should notice here is that uh, Paul gives thanks to God always for them all. Um, modeling behavior he will later exhort them to practice later in the letter. And the opening passage we read uh, is First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse um, 16 through 18, and where Paul commands us to give thanks for everything. And here he is uh, doing it here in verse 2. I found this extremely encouraging. Uh, going back to our opening scripture here, Notice how Paul commands us to rejoice always. Uh, he commands us to pray without ceasing. And in everything, give thanks. And uh, Paul is being their example. He's being our example in how to do these things. And this whole concept of being an example and a role model uh, and following those who are actively living the Christian life um, is a large part of this chapter, I think. And the next phrase, um, for you all, uh, making mention of you in our prayers. This this phrase, for you all, has the idea that Paul encircled around them all. You know, this includes, uh, you know, the whole church, the church as a whole. And uh, the making mention of you... um, You know, each time uh, that they were engaged in prayer, Paul and his companions mentioned uh, their names, for instance, possibly. Um, Did Paul have a prayer list? You know, which he read over, you know, with Silas and Timothy. You know, this topic is very fitting 
here tonight as we you know just got finished with our our, our prayer time our corporate prayer time um, did Paul have some sort of you know written prayer sheet like we do you know have more Lorna print it up for us and here you go Paul you know could could Paul remember um, all those people that he ministered to I mean he's running all over the country the Holy Spirit's got him not going somewhere going other places and um, I don't know how many people were in this church, but uh, I'm sure he met a lot of people. Um, can you and I remember everyone who is in our Christian family? I mean, there's, you know, sometimes there's almost 200 people here in this, at this church on a Sunday morning. Um, I know for me it's really difficult to remember names. As I'm not the best person to be able to remember names or connect those names with prayer requests and I don't know how else to remember them to, other than to write them down. You know, this, this all shines a light on uh, Paul's selflessness. You know, he deeply cared not only about his team, but he also um, cared about who he was ministering to. You know, just the other night, um, Laura and I were watching a documentary on TV called The Forensic Files. And uh, in one case in particular that really struck us, uh, was almost unbelievable. With this, this pharmacist in Kansas City, Missouri, he, what he did was he actively diluted prescriptions given to him by his customers just so that he could pocket the money he saved and he was stealing from the pharmaceutical companies. And he did this to like 4,000 people. Um, And the callousness at which this man did this was just astonishing. Um, All he just saw was just this name on a prescription, you know, and it wasn't like there was real people behind it. Um, I don't want in any way to compare us to to him in any way, but we really need to... um, um, you know, like take a look at our prayer sheet and the real, there's real names there, real people, you know, and um, there's real uh, lives and real people that need prayer. And, um, and, and if we actually do pray more frequently and uh, more earnestly, then I'm sure that God will, to, will work more often and, and, um, granting us our prayers. Uh, Next, in in verse 3, Paul uh, gives reasons for uh, their thankfulness, which is in uh, threefold. Um, Let's read verse verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. Um, This familiar triad of faith, love, and hope functions almost as a shorthand summary of the essentials of Christianity. Um, This phrase, work of faith, or better yet, their faith which produced works. Uh, Paul speaks here of the ministry which resulted from their personal faith in Christ. Um, Paul is very emphatic that salvation is a matter of faith, not works. And he uses the very strongest of expressions to make that clear that people are not saved by works of any kind. But when this truth is not in dispute, he does not hesitate to speak of the good works that characterize the life of faith. Next is the labor of love, or love which is promoted by their labor. Um, The phrase labor of love is, is apt to be misunderstood in, in our culture, for we, we use it as an, a, as an expression which 
uh, denotes the small services we render uh, without hope of return. Uh, but Paul's term is much stronger than that. Uh, he means that out of love, the Thessalonians have labored to the point of weariness. The word expresses uh, the cost of their love, n- not its result. You know, w- with or without visible success, success, love gives itself freely. And we all know the, the prime example of the manifestation of true love is none other, than, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He humbled himself to become a man, uh, departing the glories of heaven, which we can't even imagine. And he endured suffering and ridicule, and, and he died on the cross for every single one of us and for those at the church at Thessalonica because he loves us. And uh, he loves us, not, you know, not because we're worthy, uh, not, um, not even that we might um, someday uh, become more worthy and, you know, future possibilities of servanthood. Um, God loves us even though he knows full well our complete unworthiness. Um, with Christ as, as their example, and also with Paul as their example, the Thessalonians labored to the point of weariness out of the love of Jesus Christ and what he has done for them. You know, are, are we laboring here at North Stonington Bible Church to the point of weariness? Because God loves us, you know that's a, that's a high calling, uh, worthy of pursuit. Um, you know, in this respect, we can start by giving thanks to God always for everyone. You know, encircling this whole church. You know, just give thanks for everyone, uh, as Paul has made an example of here. And uh, the last. Uh, One is uh, the patience of hope. Here we see the the first reference uh, to the blessed hope in this epistle, uh, which is rooted in our Lord Jesus Christ and based upon his perfect character and what he has promised us. The word hope is, is a favorable and confident expectation. And it has to do with an unseen It has to do with the unseen and the future, and it describes a happy anticipation of good. This next slide, um, John Walvoord, uh, in his book, um, uh, his commentary on First and Second Thessalonians, gives this outline of the uh, based on these three words. The work of faith could be in chapter one through. Um, chapter 3, and the labor of love could be present in chapter 4 up until verse 12, and the patience of hope um, from chapter 4, verse 13 to the end of the book. Um, I'd like to spend some time looking at a few passages of Scripture where Paul uses these three important words. You know, this verse brings before us a popular combination of Paul's. Um, of faith, love, and hope, which we find in a number of places in the New Testament. And it's, a, it's apparently an accepted Christian practice to, to join these three. Uh, and while the, the linkage is found several times, um, the order varies. And in this verse, hope comes last as a climax, which is fitting because in this letter, um, Hope is given uh, the the emphasis. I'm going to look at two passages. Uh, The first one's going to be in Romans chapter 5. Let's turn there. Romans 
I'd like to read, um, I'm actually going to read until um, chapter 5, verse 1, until verse 11. I'll explain why in a minute. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Um, we see in this passage that the, res- the results of salvation, which is quite fitting to our current passage in First Thessalonians because Paul is thanking God for how they all responded to the gospel message. And they were all justified. And this passage here explains the benefits of justification. It also ties in quite nicely with Steve's message last Sunday morning where he gave the results of um, salvation, quoting um, Schaefer's 33 things accomplished at salvation. I'm not going to read through all of these because I'm running out of time. But um, Alva McLean in his book, uh, his his commentary on Romans, um, the gospel of God's grace, he gives uh, 12 things which um, we uh, gain um, um, through justification. And I'm going to... We can turn to Hebrews chapter 6. Our second verse. Our pastor went through this passage um, not too long ago. I'm going to read verses 9 through 12. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation. Though we speak in this manner, for God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now, while meditating on this um, triad of faith, love, and hope, it became apparent on how First Thessalonians was, uh, in First Thessalonians, Paul was encouraged uh, by the response Uh, of those he was serving by seeing these qualities in them. Paul thanked God for them because they were not only... um, uh, Paul thanked God for them because they were not dull of hearing. They responded with joy. But we see here in, in Hebrews that the writer of Hebrews was warning the believers there who lacked these qualities. And he was showing them how to improve. This is an interesting contrast 
And um, the writer of Hebrews shows us that he wishes them to imitate those who, through faith and patience, inherit the promises. Um, imitation is, uh, is going to come up shortly in First Thessalonians chapter 1. Um, Uh, finishing up here, um, this was from Pastor Larry's notes that he let me borrow on First Thessalonians. Uh, lest we look to ourselves, um, a faith with an object being God our Savior, uh, are we placing our faith in ourselves or in our job or what are we placing our faith in? I hope it's, hope it's in God. And our love should originate in God. You know, do we love self, or um, are we like the boss who's all he cares about of himself, or are we a team leader, a team player? And a hope in Christ's return. Um, what are we hoping for? Are we hoping for a raise at work, or um, our promotion, or um, or are we hoping for Christ's return? Quickly, what, what did we learn tonight? That uh, We learned that God's grace is the foundation of our peace. We also learned that when Paul gave thanks to God in verse um, chapter 1, verse 2, he was modeling behavior. He will later exhort them to practice in chapter 5. We also learned that the triad of faith, love, and hope is prominent in Paul's writings and can be used here as a simple outline. We also learned that Paul was encouraged by witnessing um, the benefits of uh, the justification of those he was serving in First Thessalonians. And also we, we all need to be challenged to, to not be dull of hearing when it comes to our own um, work of faith, uh, our labor of love and patience of hope. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this uh, this night and this opportunity to open your word. And just uh, thank you for um, all of these uh, things that you revealed to us. And uh, we pray that we might be able to um, shine a mirror and and, and uh, um, be more conformed to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, imitate him and uh, his character. Uh, pray for the food we'll have, and I pray for the fellowship that it might be centered on uh, on Christ and his return. And uh, pray this in Jesus' name, amen.